The plain is Jane. This is one of my favorite comments here. She says, I loves me some black. And she said, loves me some <laughs> black news. She says, is it just me or does anyone else get tired of seeing people that don't look like them delivering info about them day in and day out? I'm your girl, the plainest Jane. And let's see what's happening in these virtual streets. You ready? All right now. <laughs> this will be a crazy ride. I'm warning you now. What up and welcome back. It's your girl Jane, the plainest Jane, and we got some syrup to get into. If you watched the last show, if you follow me on Twitter and or if you are a Bank of America customer, you know that there was some big news that dropped today and big news that didn't make a lot of Bank of America customers happy because a lot of people's accounts were in the negative due to a glitch or some sort of a malfunction at the hands of the giant financial institution, it was their fault. And so I want to talk about that. Why did that happen? What are our predictions? I have an expert, okay, financial uh, financial expert coming on to tell us what they think about it. They are an eight times author. They are a retail banking expert. They're a podcast host. They're a customer service strategist. Most importantly, they used to be a branch manager for Bank of America. Why did Bank of America have nearly all of their customers' accounts in the negative today? And what can we do to make better financial decisions to avoid having Bank of America really affect us as bank? Because I am a Bank of America uh, customer. What can we do to avoid this type of stuff? This is a financial expert who is passionate about finance. Um, it is their baby to talk about what's going on in Bank of America and just finance in general. They are a consumer advocate for people uh, impacted by big banks. So without further ado, what I want you all to do, first of all, come on and hit thumbs up. Hit thumbs up on the video. If you were impacted about this, if you have a friend impacted by this, leave your questions down below in the chat so that we can have our expert answer these questions as it pertains to this. When I tell you I'm reading through pages and pages, like dozens of pages of this person's research and experience with why they feel like this happened and how they've studied Bank of America in particular and what we can be doing different so that our money and our finances and our lives don't have to be affected by situations like this. It's true. OK, so we're going to bring up the notorious banker. OK, the notorious banker. We are going to bring him up here and see what are their thoughts about this. Hello, James. How are you? Hey, I'm great. How are you doing? I'm good. <laughs> I know you have been so busy today. You have been trying to educate the people as much as possible. I have never seen somebody as passionate about finance um, as you, to be completely honest, but I get that you have a certain amount of different experience and you know, because the thing is, it's Bank of America in hot water today and Zelle because Bank of America and Zelle are, um, you know, they, they have this partnership. And so, you know, specifically what Bank of America and how they instructed you to tell your customers when you work there, how, or your clients, um, how to engage with Zell. Thank you for being a part of the show this evening. No problem. Thank you. Let me see. What is, what is, I'm trying to figure out what's the first question I want to ask you. <laughs> There's so many. Um, th there are, there are so many. And I, what I did appreciate is when we were talking behind the scenes before, when we were setting up this interview is you do care about the impact of black and brown people and how we are affected by these larger financial institutions when they do things that we may deem to be underhanded stuff like this. Um, right. I want to know specifically from you, 
what you think happened and why you think Bank of America will never admit to making a mistake and how this impacts working class people. Well, again, thank you for having me on. Um, basically, it comes down to a couple of things. OK, you know, the whole point of Zelle is to make everything self-service. You know, self-serve gasoline happened 30 years ago. Self-checkout is in every store now. They basically don't want to have employees helping you with doing transfers at the teller window anymore. So, you know, banks have trained customers to do everything through self-service means. Now, you mentioned that, you know, Bank of America and Zelle are um, a partnership. Well, Bank of America actually owns Zelle through a company called Early Warning Services. Hmm. Bank of America, Chase, Capital One, Wells Fargo all collectively own Zell. So they are all in it together. So, you know, a lot of the times, you know, people ask me, well, why are all these banks in bed owning Zell? And I'm like, it's quite simple. It's because they want to make as much money as possible by trying to get rid of the riffraff. And what I mean by riffraff is, you know, the grandma sending $50 to, to her grandson, you know, standing in a 30 minute line. Well, James, the notorious banker, the, the manager, can't offer a credit card or a checking account to other people on the line because they're pissed off that they can't get through the line fast enough. So that person behind the grandma is like, well, I, I, I would stop and talk to you about the credit card, but guess what? I'm in this long line. Now I don't have time. So the goal of banks was to eliminate that person from that line. And typically it's a low dollar transaction. So you asked me what I think happened today. Um, Zelle has been um, notorious, no pun intended, with fraud and hacking the last couple of years, but I don't think it was that this time. I'll actually give the bank the benefit of the doubt here and say, you know, I don't think it was anything nefarious. The way that it sounded like, because Bank of America put an alert up saying that between January 14th and the 17th, anyone who used Zelle may have been impacted by that. I think the holiday weekend actually had something to do with it. I think for some reason, the system, the quote unquote system that Bank of America has um, didn't recognize MLK Day as a federal holiday. And what happened was the first business day of the week, which was yesterday, Tuesday, um, came around and all those things didn't hard post to use a banking term. So when they didn't hard post, they bounced back because Bank of America is essentially saying, well, we don't have the data that supports this $50 transfer from me to my mom or me to my cousin or whatever. So mm -hmm. I think it was a glitch due to a glut of transactions and there wasn't any data behind that to, to reconcile it, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Okay. So what's the reason they couldn't just tell people that what's the reason why they had people on hold and we had five hour wait times. What's the reason for that? <laughs> So, you know, the thing with Bank of America is, you know, whenever you have problem handling inside a branch, if someone says, where the hell is my money at? There's $500 missing, whatever. You're trained to acknowledge the problem. I say, sir, um, I understand what you're going through right now. It's, it's a frustrating situation. Um, what I can do is put you on the phone with someone who can help you. Basically, you're still training that person to be self-served. You're training that person to not rely on you because you inside the branch is the salesperson. So Bank of America never wants to, and most banks do this too, Bank of America or most banks don't want you to know that the person inside the branch is there strictly for sales, strictly for sales. So the five hour wait times is a byproduct of everyone going through the same crap at the same time and no one acknowledging that there's a problem. If Bank of America put out a statement saying, hey, you know what, our bad, we, we, we had a little glitch and we're working on fixing it. Thank you so much for your patience. I think the call volume would have been down by 80, 90% at a minimum because at least someone who was searching for blood on Twitter would have seen, hey, Bank of America is trying to make an effort to do that. But they didn't do that because what I learned from 13 years of working at Bank of America is they, they don't want to acknowledge that, they're, um, that they, they can have flaws that they can do stuff wrong, never to acknowledge something because they feel that that's going to be used against them somewhere down the line. It's like, oh yeah, that's the bank that lost all the money last year. You know, they think that that's what people are going to think of them. So their social media team just kind of just says, you know what, if I don't look at it, it's not there. 
I just, it's, you know, to hear that it was a holiday issue kind of makes it a little bit easier than they got also not on the phone or they aren't answering the phone because of, you know, certain circumstances. That's just crazy. It seems that they're avoiding, you know, their customers. Avoiding, and like us, They're avoiding confrontation is what they're yeah. doing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. They're avoiding the whole con confrontation for someone. And, you know, you know, I've mentioned to people before planting seeds for future sales while they feel that that tree is going to be knocked down if you pissed off that person enough. They're like, you know, I'm taking my, my ball and going somewhere else. I'm taking my money and going to Wells Fargo or to another bank because they, they feel that um, no news is good news. And if you give someone bad news, that might be the end of the world. So they just try to avoid that one-to-one -one conversation. And their social media team was basically doing a piss poor job today in acknowledging the problem. It's just like, DM us and we'll see what we can do. They couldn't do anything. I mean, it, it, it's a big deal because it mostly affected people who utilize Zelle. Yes. And Zelle is what I want to hone in because you, you have a lot. You have over a decade of experience with... Right. Bank of America and how they are able to utilize Zelle. And it's it's it was mainly in mainly the people who utilize Zelle who really had this issue. Accounts of the negative. Imagine the people who needed gas to get to work. Imagine the people right. traveling who weren't in there. Imagine people who just need to get food and eat a happy meal on lunch. Like right. imagine, you know, people like that. Like that is it's really unfortunate that you can't get answers like that. And that this glitch. It's going to affect people. Some people feel like the money was traded. You know, a lot of times when you put your money in banks, banks are using your money. Yes, they're to, using it to lend. To do, out yeah. You know, to do other things on the back end. So it's just like, what in the Bitcoin is going on right now? Like, what are y'all doing with our funds? Um, and and right. inconveniencing us, I'm pretty sure Bank of America isn't going to accommodate people or give them you know if you go to a hotel and you got an inconvenience they finna give you a suite above they try right. they're they gonna give you a little bit more than what you said pretty sure bank of america ain't finna give people a couple more dollars a couple hundred more dollars thousand <laughs> more dollars whatever i just had a homegirl that told me they were affected by thousands of dollars because it depends on your business some businesses they rely on zell to do it right you know? right Right. And, and my, my thing with that is, like you said, what are they going to give you? What are they going to accommodate you with as a result of your, your pain and suffering, if you want to call it that, for this delay of being able to use your money? You know what they're going to give you? They're going to give you a lesson. It's like, you know, next time, maybe we should set up a savings account and throw $5 in there every week. That way you have 20 bucks. In case this happens again, you can put gas, you can go get your Happy Meal, you can go get your Value Meal at Burger King. I, I think that's what that conversation would be is... You know, you acknowledge the problem and you find a solution. And at Bank of America speak, the word solution means sell. It means sales. That's what mm -hmm. it means. Solutions aren't the answers to problems. Solutions are accounts that give me a bonus, that give other people a bonus. And while I think there are people who do need help saving money, pushing accounts on them isn't the way to do it. And talking to them, acknowledging the problem, seeing that person cry and say, hey, I couldn't use my money today. What happened to you guys? I trusted you that's going to give real financial advice because you're going to feel what they feel, not feel what your bosses tell you to feel. Yeah, it's true. I want to ask you about the ethics that you think does or does not exist in Bank of America. And then I want to ask you about Zelle and it being used as a sales point for Bank of America. But first, let's get into the ethics Right. What what as a former employee who used to be there for thirteen years and and these are just let me let me first say this none of this is financial advice I got to protect my yeah, channel right. right absolutely none of this is financial advice we're not telling you how to live your life this is just somebody um, sharing their experience their predictions and their opinions based off of their over a decade of experience with Bank of America and their thoughts so let's just get that out the way to protect myself and my channel. What do you think about Bank of America's ethics pertaining to their employees or lack thereof? So, you know, Bank of America currently, I believe, has 206,000 employees. So that's the size of a small city. Do I think all 206,000 employees are unethical people? Absolutely not. I, I worked with a good amount of ethical, honest people, single moms, 
you know, people who were first generation immigrants. You know, there are people who came here from Germany, from Mexico that I worked with that busted their ass to, to make a decent living at this job and were good at it. So I think that these people are the ones that want to hang on to those jobs. So I really do believe that ethically they're, they're righteous, they're good people. But what happens is there are challenges every single day that challenge those ethics. And basically, um, in my little branch here, Las Cruces, New Mexico, I'm about 30 miles away from the Mexican border in a metro area with roughly two and a half million people, if you include Juarez, Mexico. So you have all those people. So my goal was 10 checking accounts a day. And guess what? I helped 25 to 30 people a day at a, you know, at the maximum. So I had to get a new account, a new relationship with one out of every three customers. So basically you become the drunk guy at the bar at 1.45 a.m. just asking to, to hook up for the night. Hey, do you want to go back to my place? You're basically telling these customers, hey, do you want to set up an account with us? It's only X amount of dollars to set it up and I can get you a free account and a debit card today. You're sales pitching the hell out of something that while you believe in it, you feel dirty doing it because you had to do it so many times. So I think the ethics on a branch level are are they're borderline. If a good if you have a good branch manager and you have a good banker, you might run a decent place. But guess what? If you're running a decent place, you're probably not hitting your sales goals. So it's going to resort to right. take applications for credit cards for 18 year old kids. It's going to be pushing that fourth or fifth credit card on a senior citizen customer, or it's going to basically plant the seed to refinance um, a home loan to do a home equity loan, um, telling someone that they need to possibly do repairs on their house when you've never stepped in their house before. So you don't know what the hell they need. And that's when the ethics become a little cloudy is when you oversell everything including online banking and Zelle, things that some people just don't want to use, yet you're pushing it on them because guess what? Zelle is part of my sales goal too. Yeah, uh, I I agree. Uh, I mean, I agree with what you're saying, but I feel like Bank of America's ethics are a little more shitty I, I, I said the branch level. So the regional part of it, the, the people that never look a customer in the eye, that's where they're shitty. That's, that's where the ethics are just horrible because it's those people who make three or four times more than I did in my role who are pushing you to sell 10 accounts today to people who basically don't need them multiply that by 20 to 30 bankers in a region mm -hmm. they're they're impacting those 30 bankers and those bankers are impacting 25 to 30 people a day so as you go up the 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 staircase of the hierarchy of bank of america the ethics get a lot shittier because those are the people who make decisions about closing branches about closing drive-through windows which impacts a lot of people with kids it That's does it. believe it or yeah. not those those is like why did you close the drive-through window Oh, because we have so many more options like coming inside so I can sales pitch you or going online. That way you don't bother me so I can sales pitch someone else. Yeah. People Those don't realize when you when you myself. see your bank branch in, in whatever your area, whatever area, and they've closed the drive through window, you might think it's a dying branch in it. And it more than likely is. If it's a thriving branch, they're going to leave it open. But when they close it, sometimes it is a tactic to get you to come in. Yes, so that it, whatever your up. simple transaction is, the teller is going to get you to the personal banker or the personal banker is going to be out around hovering around the line. Yes. They're going to be hovering around the line. Hey, you just on deposit? Hey, you just, or, or, or is there anything? Mm -hmm. And if they can get you to that desk, baby, mm -hmm. they are trying exactly. to tell you that, that role is the lobby leader. Lobby leader. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what it is. And it, I mean, it just... You know, the, the, the personal experience I have that I'm not necessarily willing to speak on, but baby, when I tell you, I know what I know, it is what it is. So let me ask you this. Um, Zelle being used as a sales point as a Bank of America manager. What is the sales point? Because Zelle, Zelle came after what I'm familiar with, with Bank of America. So I I don't understand it. I've never used it. And even and, and I know all the gimmicks that banks give. I've, I've you know I've had several sales jobs. 
I don't understand it as, as a sales pitch. Can you elaborate on that for us? So the sales pitch is online banking. Online banking is part of any personal banker's sales goal. So there's a point system attached to um, opening accounts and having a monthly and a quarterly goal at a bank. So, you know, it's it's a long-winded conversation to have. But let's just say that my sales goal for the quarter is 50,000 points. A checking account is worth 100 points. So theoretically, I have to open up 500 checking accounts in order to hit my goal. But you get additional bonus points for add-ons. Add-ons are direct deposit, credit card usage, um, debit card usage, and online banking and mobile banking. Those are two separate buckets. Mobile banking is to show that you activated it on someone's cell phone. Online banking is the desktop version of it. Each of them carries part of my sales quota. So I'm, I'm gold on that. I have a goal of you know, eight to 10 online bankings a day that people have to enroll in. So I'm pushing this product on people who may not be computer literate, who may, you know, we all, we all have family members who have iPhones and they don't know how to work them. Mm-hmm. You know, we have people in our lives like that. So we're showing them, hey, this is what you do to sign in to check your balance on your phone. That way you don't have to come in and stand in the line and talk to me for it. So the sales pitch is the sales pitch to get them out of there, basically. Because if you have those people who don't have a lot of money, who don't have a lot of opportunity, who don't have good credit, you don't want them standing in your line. And that's the shittiest part of it. That's that's the crappiest part of being a banker is you're you're getting something from them by pushing them away. Mm. And that and that's that's 100 percent why it's a sales goal. Um Op, you know, opportunity is what they call it there because they're like, Hey, you're making the most out of your opportunities. You got something from this person who otherwise probably couldn't qualify for a credit card. So do you just push that away from people who you feel like aren't, um, you know, don't have the credit or the whatever for you to sell anything to them or are you pushing sell to everybody? You're pushing sell to everyone because what you want to do is of course you want even the, the most qualified customers to not waste your time unless you're doing a sales pitch to them. You don't want them to say, Hey, I only have 30 minutes and I spent 20 minutes of it in line to send 20 bucks to my brother in another town. So you, you want that seed planted for those people too. That way when those people who make a lot of money and, and of course we know this people who make a lot of money, make their own hours. So they're able to go into the branch at 12 o'clock in the afternoon and say, hey, James, I got 30 minutes to talk about a refinance on my home loan. And and basically, you showed them how to do all the other stuff. That way you can kind of isolate that time for me and you. And you plant that seed, you woo them, you say, hey, thank you for being a preferred customer, Mr. Rich Guy, I appreciate your business. And you woo them to come back to you, keep on giving that business card too. So it is for everyone. But I think Zell is actually too full. It's to push those people out that you don't want standing in line and to make people uber efficient. That way, the ones that actually have something to talk to you about, they can do it on their own time and then come in and talk to you about the good stuff. You know, I, I, I find it to be a a crappy... And it's not you, right? It's what, it's what you were told. I find but, that to be a really crappy tactic. And you have some people with good and bad credit, like but even people with good credit and, and good prospects where if they sit down at the desk, you might be able to uncover stuff through your financial review right. of, of of how you can get them other into other things, a mortgage refinance, your auto loan, um, you know, a, a credit card, whatever the case is. And some people, and, and especially with this overtake of the, like the, the digital takeover, it's vast. Right. And some people just prefer to speak to somebody in person. And sometimes it's Absolutely. the people that prefer to speak to somebody in person. That's where you can uncover something where they appreciate that person to person contact that's different, where you can uncover something. Not to say that that you know I want the personal banker to be to, to be able to sell whatever to whoever. But it's like you're you're not you, but you know the the bank is essentially sending everybody out the door because they're getting lazy. I remember in the Bank of America in my area, um, you know, I walk in there and it, and it's still kind of like that, but they've changed it because I think they've realized that people just don't like it, especially when you got the older people. 
anybody yep. over 40, they're going to have a problem working that technology, period. Yep. Absolutely. They're going to have a problem. And they want you to go up to the ATM, and instead of you getting to a teller, they got one teller. And especially on the payday, back, back when... <laughs> When yep, payday right. was based off of physical checks for me, which was like a couple years ago, physical checks, payday, one teller. And I, fe I felt like they did it on purpose, Bank of they, America. They one schedule. teller, you got 20 people in line. So you go in the bank, it's 20 people in the physical line. Don't nobody want to wait two hours to cash their check. So they get you to go up to the ATM when you go up to the ATM. And then there's a person that, so there's a person on the ATM that's cashing your check for you. But, you know, elder people, they have a problem with that. And elder mm -hmm. people are vulnerable and 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 um you might be able to talk them into different financial solutions that they didn't even know were available and that's the nicest way of putting it you you, you get what i'm saying yeah i, I totally get what you're saying <laughs> so and, and older people they either have no money or they have a lot of money but they don't want to do things with it they don't want to invest they don't want to open up new accounts they don't want to buy another house so to bank of america the phrase old money to them it's it's useless to them because Bank of America is not going to make money on that money because that little old lady is going to keep her nest egg in that savings account. So you standing in my line, you're just as worthless to me as someone who has five dollars if you have fifty thousand. Yeah, it 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 sucks because a lot of it, even outside of Bank of America, you can walk into a credit union, nothing but ATM, literally no tellers, no tellers. Right. 10 ATMs and two personal bankers. And that's it. And the personal bankers can't get you no money or whatever. You have to go to the ATM in order to do it. So, you know, that that aspect of it sucks. But, it's, you know. It's the future. The future is now. You know, most people think that it's a Bank of America exclusive thing. But, you know, as I mentioned, you know, especially with COVID and stuff, self-checkout, mobile ordering and stuff for food, all this stuff was, was teaching us to be self-reliant businesses saw that and it's like hey it's like the jenga game you know we pull these little bricks out of the jenga board and i was like how many of these suckers can we move before the whole thing comes tumbling over and it's one employee here it's one location there and they figure out a way to balance while overworking the craft out of the remaining employees but i i, I feel like it sucks and it kicks the older people out of their their comfort zone, which yeah. may really make them go somewhere else. My grandmother's never going, you can suggest that shit to my grandmother every time she goes in there. She's not buying it. Right. She's right. not, she's, she's not, <laughs> she's not buying it. So it's, I, I, I feel like it's, it's unfortunate. And there is still an opportunity to sell stuff to my grandmother. But if everything is electronic, she's never going to do it. My grandmother feels like, Paying your bills online is dangerous because anybody can get your credit card information. Yep. So she's more comfortable sending a check, baby, yeah. the, the check with the account and routing number on there through the mail, which honestly is more dangerous <laughs> yeah. in my opinion. But, you know, when they're used to what they're used to, it is what it is. I, I, I feel like they should do more. But I mean, hey, if that keeps them from selling stuff to her, I mean, it, it, it is what it is. It's right. it is. It's unfortunate. The, here's here's the next thing I want to know about outside of the fact that um, they're trying to use you know the the, the technology can be kind of irritating um, with it. You wrote a book, and I saw in my research when I was researching you, and and I see there's a couple of new people in here. Seventy thumbs up. It's 136 people here. Y'all get the likes up and ask you a question because especially if you bank with Bank of America, but honestly, this could happen with any bank. This could right. happen with Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo would have made plenty of missteps. So has Chase and everybody else. Ask your financial questions when it comes to the missteps that these financial institutions are taking. I saw that you had wrote a book because if, if you don't know, if you just came in, Bank of America had more than half of their customers' accounts in the negative today based off of some major glitch, okay? So there's a lot going on with the entertainment and uh, um the financial industry that you all don't know about. So you wrote a book about Ryan Coogler's um, Bank of America incident last right. year. Yes, I um, did. And you released it on Amazon. Tell us about that book and how you feel like that book parallels to what you talk about with customer service and Bank of America and any other institution not admitting that they messed up. Well, it's all about acknowledging that you made the mistake, which Bank of America only did after it came out two months later. The police um, body cam footage came out showing Kugler being arrested. And, and my biggest thing with that was 
you know, his request was to take out $12,000 of cash. He was going to pay his nanny or something like that, which, you know, as a banker and as a person, I'm like, that's weird to pay someone in hundreds, but it's not my damn business. You asked me to do something for you. I'm going to do it. But the teller mis mistook his request, which was on a piece of paper for a robbery. She calls the cops Atlanta PD comes to the Bank of America branch there in the Buckhead section of Atlanta. I'm not really familiar with the area and arrests him. They, they arrest him on suspicion of bank robbery when it was all a misunderstanding. And I wrote that book. Um, I wrote it in five days. <laughs> it was the craziest five days of my life because once that story came out last March, they released something like 22 hours of body cam footage I watched every single minute of it. That's a lot. Yeah, I, I watched every single minute because I wanted to see what the branch manager was saying, what the teller said, what made the teller think that she was being robbed. And I was listening to the manager when she was spouting her supposed protocols. And I'm like, I was a relationship manager. That's not right what you did. You broke a part of your procedure, you know, and your training is to tell you if you feel nervous, go ahead and hit that button. But there was really no cause to hit that button other than she misunderstood what he was saying. Yeah, he was wearing a mask and some people are better reading lips and stuff like that. I understand that stuff. But at the same time, you should read the room. Did Why did you feel so nervous? Where was your training at that you couldn't figure out a simple withdrawal request from a bank robbery? And I think that was the the the, the crux of it. So I wrote it basically pointing out everything that the bank did wrong. Did the cops do stuff wrong too? Absolutely. And and I even had a chapter in there. Did Kugler, Ryan Kugler, maybe he did something a little bit, um, you know, something that, you know, you wouldn't want a customer to do? No, not really. Not really. But I wanted to point out all the things that I saw wrong with that because guess what? I was there in a branch 310 days a year for 13 years. And something just didn't wash with me when I saw the body cam footage. So I felt compelled to write that book. I'm still here. I don't oh, okay. Um, here. But yeah, no, like, um, let me just go ahead and reiterate just to make sure I have my, my, um, I guess you would call it legal assistant say like to put up a good disclaimer, Jane, the information <laughs> provided does not constitute as investment, financial trading or any other sort of advice. And you shouldn't treat any of the concept content as such. And that is absolutely true. Absolutely. Um, but I, I, I am glad that you wrote that. And it's, so you're an eight times author. What else have you written about? Um, you know, that was my, to finances. Um, I wrote a book about pandemic unemployment uh, um, a few months before that, because like everyone else, you know, I, I had my finances impacted by COVID. So I was trying to actually um, get unemployment. And I and I noticed that every state, because I was looking on Twitter too, every state was going through the same runaround um, and necessarily, you know, denying people or delaying their, their COVID payments. Do you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So, so basically I wrote, a, I wrote this thing about my letters to the person who was in charge of my case saying, you're, you're, you're doing things to me that I used to do in a bank, which is blow people off <laughs> who, mm -hmm. who I, who I couldn't help or I didn't want to help. So, um, there was a lot of instances going on, especially in California Nevada, Arizona, and Maryland. All four of those states had Bank of America, ironically enough, as the proprietors for the unemployment checks. Wow. They were the ones that were sending the checks, and they were using Bank of America tactics, the five-hour wait times and the don't come into the branch, call this number, and we'll call you back type of tactics to deny unemployment benefits. But that was really more about me. You know, that one was more about, hey, I need this money. <laughs> you know, I need this money to survive. It's like, if you're going to give me this money, well then give it to me. Don't, don't dance around it. Cause eventually you're going to have to pay me at some point. And, and during one point of the conversation um, I was having about my, my unemployment, they said, well, we're going to call you back in six months to a year. And I'm like, well, I might be dead in a year. <laughs> so, you know, if, if I'm approved now, why can't you pay it now? Why are you making it twice as hard for you? 
Mm-hmm. And then um, other books that I wrote, just basically about my life. A lot of the times I used to write blogs and stuff when I was in my 20s. You know, I've been kind of a social media person for a long time. So I always talked about relationships and friendships and stuff before I got married. You know, when you get married and you have a, a nine to five job, that's pretty much your whole life. But beforehand, I was a sharer. Let's just put it that way. A social media sharer. <laughs> okay, so let me ask you this. Somebody asked this. Um to me personally um when i told him that i would be speaking with you and based off of the the situation that everybody's been in a tizzy about today mm-hmm. um what is the benefit for a company to pay their employees via zell or and or what are the disadvantages of a company paying their employees via zell You know, the advantages are theoretically that it's easier. It's easier to navigate. You know, everything is computer based. If you're computer savvy, you may find a benefit to that. I think the disadvantages, it just really depends on the people who are supplementing your, let's say during tax time, you know, maybe you have an old school account that's like, what the hell is this? These Zell, you know, statements, these Zell payments that you get, why isn't it a proper paycheck or whatever we live in you know these areas that have still old school people people who like things the traditional way so i think the adaptation of that of paying you know people via zelle isn't all the way there yet banks want you to be able to um use zelle for everything at first it was send it to your trusted friends and family and then all of a sudden it was send it to companies that you possibly trust or send it to merchants that you trust, they're starting to broaden it out. So um, basically what banks want to do is they want to take over that market because there's all these companies like ADT, um, companies like that, that do payment processing for employers. They want to horn in on that. And Zelle was the, you know, it, you know, that's like what they say about drug dealers. The first hit is free. You know, Zelle, Zelle is basically, Hey, look, you can use this for your personal and then if you have a small business or you have a friend that's that's in a small business, they could use it for that too. So, you know, banks want you to do that because it streamlines their process and they're going to be able to get rid of their um, payment processing departments because that's a big industry with Bank of America too. So the disadvantages are not everyone is adapted yet. You know, there are still people, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 40 years old in a couple of months. So people my age and older that are just still old school. They were raised by folks that are, you know, now in their 60s and 70s. And those people are totally old school. You know, those people are like computer nothing. So, you know, I think the only disadvantage, and like I said, I'm, I'm a technology guy. I try to be a technology guy. But the only disadvantage is not everyone's adapted to it yet. Is it, is it, is it instant? I did it one time. I was working with my coworker. And I was like, oh, I'm going to Subway to buy our, our you know, and she was like, okay, oh, you get me this, this, this. And then you sell, and it wasn't instant. And that made me upset. Right. Um, the commercials that they have, the few commercials that have been shown on network TV say you can send money in minutes. And then there's a little tiny asterisk that you can't see. You know, if you if you have bad vision like me, you, you know, pause the TV, you look at it and you see a little asterisk and it says can take up to three business days. And a lot of times the three business days is based on relationship. If you're sending ninety nine dollars and you only have one hundred dollars in your account. They're going to put that sucker on a, on a hold because they're like, well, this one's risky because if this dude overdrafts his account while this money is being in transit, we're going to be left holding the bag and we're going to have to overdraft this person. So people who don't have a lot of money tend to fall into that. It's not instant thing. Yeah, if you have $10,000 in your checking account, you're sending it to someone who's established and has that much. Instant is is a relative term. I mean, five minutes is pretty fast, but it's... In most cases, but if you look at any advertisement and definitely do that after we get off here, look at Zelle and see that little asterisk and it'll say it could take up to three business days. Mm, That's interesting because it was just six dollars and I was mad about that six (laughs) dollars. I was upset. Yeah, I would be like, and I got back because I damn near didn't want to give her her sandwich because I got back and I'm like, I don't got the six dollars. She was like, well, look, I sent you James. it, it, it breeds distrust amongst friends and coworkers. It's like, look, I sent it to you. It's right here. Well, I don't got it. Well, I don't know. And guess what? That leads to calling customer service too and say, hey, where's my $6 at? You know, because people will do that. People will call and say, hey, where's where's my money at? And even if it's $6, they'll do that, which leads to a 
more dissatisfaction for customers too. So like I said, it's a crapshoot sometimes with these things. Sometimes they work perfectly, but times like today where thousands of people are sharing their horrible experience didn't work so perfectly. Yeah, that's why that that was that was one of my first and last times using Zelle. I was just like, I'm not with it. I would rather do Cash App. Cash App is so goddamn instant. I could send you the money on Cash App right now and hit a coin to your phone because that's the sound effect that they you hit right. It, it, it's right away. You don't have to question whether. Uh, mm -mm, yeah, that's 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 why I don't use I don't use Zelle. I just can't get with that. And I was checking my bank account for the rest of that day, and it still wasn't there. Right. And so I just stopped checking for my six dollars. I assumed I never got it. That's my assumption. But I don't know if I did get it because I'm not about to be checking my account for days at a time. Over no six bucks. I'm going to just take it as a loss and just say Zell ain't shit and that employee ain't shit. Both, I don't know which one of y'all it is, but I'm going to assume it's both of y'all. Right, right. And, and and that's the thing, you know, and, and they want you to use it. But then whenever there's a flaw with it, they don't have an answer for it. Like today, you know, like I've had people whenever I was working at B of A because I left in 2018. Zell was kind of formally rolled out in 2017. So I had a good year of seeing the flaws um, with it from that side of the aisle, from being an actual employee at the bank. And I would see these customers saying, well, you know, where's my money? Or I got defrauded. And our, you know, our training said to put them on the phone, which to me was bank speak for it's not your damn business. Get them out of your office. You know, that's someone else's problem. And that's the thing. Zell is like, like I mentioned at the beginning of this is owned by, Bank of America through a third party company called EWS. But whenever the shit hits the fan like it did today, they're going to say, oh, well, that our third party partner, Zelle, had a, had a had a, you know, issue with their you know services or whatever today. Oh, now you call them your third party partner. But in reality, guess what? They're the ones that are cutting the checks at Zelle. Now, so they're, yeah, they're not your third party partner. They're you, you know, they're the bank. Is that the same as their relationship or ownership with Merrill Edge Investments? Uh, Merrill, they bought Merrill Lynch, which became Merrill Edge and Merrill now um, in 2008 with the um, economic crisis. So they own that. It's not a, oh, that's our partner. As a banker, as a personal banker relationship manager inside a branch, I wasn't licensed with Merrill Lynch. I wasn't a financial advisor. So I had to use the phrase partner in the sense that they're my partner, aka coworker. But, you know, Bank of America is using the phrase partner for Zelle as, a, oh, no, we struck up a deal with this startup company called Zelle. No, it's like you're Bank of America. But people in Merrill Lynch are Bank of America employees. They have the word marks, the logos on their business cards, too. So it, it's a very loose um, use of words, in my opinion. Mm. <clears throat> I wanted you to answer that question explicitly because I already had... Um... An answer in my head about it that 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 I knew. There's a question in the chat. It says, "Will he be able to, or is he willing to discuss the implicit racial bias in America's banking system, such as redlining and predatory loans?" Absolutely. Um, you know, the redlining thing is interesting because um, I mentioned I live in southern New Mexico. We're 80 percent Hispanic here. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, El Paso, Texas is nearby 85 percent Hispanic. And guess what? We're next to Juarez, Mexico, which is 100 percent international. You know what I mean? So uh -huh. a lot of customers from all other parts of, of this area coming here. And I noticed it in my area, too. So basically, this is the thing. This, this is what I wish people knew. And I try to enlighten them on whenever we're talking about um, not being able to get a home loan through a place like Bank of America. So you have me, who is a salesperson, who my job is to plant that seed for you to get that home loan. Okay, so it's like, hey, we, you should buy a home. You know, the the house prices are perfect over here. I send your information over to a mortgage officer whose goal is not how many people I can plant the seed with. Their goal is dollars in revenue. So if you're if you're a person that's in an inner city who maybe lives in a in a zip code where the the property values are nothing, and you can get yourself a starter home for a hundred thousand dollars, which is not an unreasonable amount of money in an inner city area, because I grew up you know forty minutes from one. Um, you're gonna you're gonna apply for that home loan, 
And then this dude is going to have this $100,000 loan with all the paperwork here. Or guess what? He got a phone call from someone in Beverly Hills, 90210, with a $5 million house, 820 credit score, and there's not going to be any hurdles along the way. Meanwhile, the person in that starter home in um, you know, a difficult zip code, let's say, may have less than stellar credit, may have a 620 credit score. So that one's going to be a bit of work. And it's like, do I want to work very, very easy and get a $5 million house? Or do I want to work my ass off and maybe, just maybe I can get approved uh, for this $100,000 customer for this starter home? And I think, honestly, this is this is something that no one talks about but me. I think the the the, the discrimination that happens in the housing industry, or well, the banking industry with housing is that you goal people on revenue generated, not amount of people that you help. I can help three people with $5 million houses each make $15 million in revenue for my bank, or I can help a hundred people with hundred thousand dollar houses. And they're like, why the hell are you working so hard? These people might not even be able to pay their house in two, three years or whatever. And that's the way the mindset of the bank is. They want you to focus on those rich people because guess what? They're probably going to buy another house, right? They're going to buy a vacation home in Colorado or they're going to buy a beach home. That's that's where the bias comes from. You know, is it necessarily, oh, it's racist? Yeah, in my opinion, it is. But a lot of it is all tied down to how much money can you make from two people with exactly the same application. I live in New Mexico where property values are not that good. You can buy a decent house for $130,000 over here. Guess what you can buy for $130,000 in California? Nothing. <laughs> you can buy a shack. So, um, you, you know, that's where that comes from. So absolutely, there's there's red line, there's bias. I think people don't see it the way that I do because it took me a while to figure it out. And, and I'll be blunt with you. And I've been kind of dabbling on a book about my life in banking. I had this happen to me too. This room that I'm speaking to in my home office six years ago, I was homeless because of Bank of America. I was working on my home loan while working as a manager at Bank of America. And they pulled that same BS on me. Oh, we didn't get your paperwork. Oh, this and that. And my loan closing date passed. And guess what? I didn't get the keys to my house. And they were doing everything they could to make sure that um, I wasn't going to get my house. I later found out that the person, the mortgage officer that was working with me is actually what's called Pinnacle Club, which means she's the top sales earner in the region. She wasn't making her top sales performance with me in my little house. She was making it with rich people. So she was blowing me off. So I got impacted by this too. I am a Mexican-American man and I felt that tinge. I felt that um, emails being ignored phone calls going to voicemail and I couldn't have my direct boss help me with my plight because of code of ethics stuff. You know what I mean? They're like, Oh, they can't help you with that. That's showing favoritism. So I had to rely on my partners, my coworkers in another state that couldn't give a damn about us. And my wife and I fought like hell for this house and I won. And that's actually what empowered me to do this consumer advocacy. What, what can consumers do? <clears throat> to combat and beat the the predatory practices okay bank of america went down today outside of trying to ensure that you have funds in more than one institution because you know if, if if everyone's account was in the the negative today if just about everyone because i bank with bank of america but i don't use zelle so therefore my account wasn't yeah. affected but i still i still felt some type of way because i felt like well th but this could have been me if the glitch was just on the left of my participation or, 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 you know, involvement with y'all institution, it could have easily inched over here to me. So I felt some type of way before I checked my, my bank account. And I was, I was tweeting like it was me too. Cause I thought it was. Before yeah, I, and you were. I, saw, I saw you and I was like, Hey, you know, you're invested in this <laughs> That's important thing because two things. Okay. You, you're on social media too. You have a following. You have a lot of people that love you too. I'm the same way. I'm going to jump on the pile too even though I haven't used Zelle since it rolled out five years ago. You know what I mean? Like I knew that this was an important topic. So you felt like it was happening to you because you knew that you had possibly friends and family that it was happening to them. And I can tell you that I was immediately channeling me in the branch with five people waiting for me um, to go into my office and say, where's my money at? Oh my God, where's it at? What are you going to do? 
put you on the phone. I, I immediately felt that. And that's what I feel anytime these stories happen. So, you know, you ask what can customers do? Honestly, be vigilant. Look at your account. If they want you to use online banking, okay, well, you don't have to do all the, the fringy stuff. You don't have to do Zelle. You don't have to do all that. Check your balance. Kind of know where you're at. That way you at least have a, a place to start from when complaining. The second part is, and, and this is what I say as a, because you mentioned me, I'm a consumer strategist, customer service strategist. Um, know who to yell at. <laughs> a lot of people yell at bank tellers. A lot of people even yell in my role as relationship manager, of Bank of America. Guess what? There's 13 steps to CEO of Bank of America aside from me. Make your voice heard in a direction that it's going to be heard for someone who can help. Because customer service, the 1-800 number and shouting at people on Twitter, you know, at Bank of America, where's my money? At Burger King, my food was cold. You know, at Burger King isn't going to fix your burger. Talk to the manager of that Burger King and say, hey, uh, my burger was cold. Can you not do that next time? What can, what, what can I do as a customer to make this right? Be an informed customer. Understand that these things with Zelle have happened multiple times in different formats. So don't be like, oh, my God, what happened to me? What happened to me? Only when it happens to you. Be aware of what's going on in the news. You know, have that. But what, what can we do to, to, to be proactive to still have money? Let's say the people who literally had, we're, we're traveling. And, and Bank of America is a made and only bank. Like, what, what, what can they do to get ahead of mistakes that they can't even foresee? outside of who can we complain to when the mistake happens like what can we do you fight back against the the methods that i was taught which is pushing customers away develop those relationships they don't want you to go into a branch go into a branch go ask for a printed statement and say hey your name is james can i have your business card have that business card that way you have that direct line I think a, a lot of the problems is, you know, and like, like I mentioned, I'm in my late 30s. I'm going to turn 40 in April. We don't establish relationships anymore. Sometimes someone who's willing to go the next step for you, even if it's not their job, might be just a conversation away. And, and you got to forge those relationships and force that, force that communication, especially with the companies that you deal with, especially who are handling your money. So, you know, you should always foresee something happening a couple of steps down the road because, um, you know, there's that thing that they always talk about where 50% um, of Americans can't handle a $400 emergency or whatever. Well, that's a pretty telling thing. You know, you need to look at yourself in the mirror and say, hey, what's going on with me? And then secondarily, if this is the company that I'm trusting with my money, how are they going to be able to help me? So honestly, as, as old school as it sounds, establish relationships. Go to your local branch, even if you have no reason to be there. Get a business card. Get someone's direct email address. Don't, don't send it to help at bava.com. You know? Get that person's email address saying, hey, can you give me any guidance? You might find a diamond in the rough there with customer service because we all know bad customer service when we see it. And, and, and I think sometimes, you know, like I said um, at the beginning of this, there's some good people there. And I think there are some decent people who are willing to help and go out of their way to help you. So honestly, to, to be proactive and to know who's handling your money. Bank of America is a $250 billion company. They don't give a damn about you. You're one of 67 million customers. But inside a branch, guess what? You're possibly one of 20 people that that person saw that day. Yeah. Um, trying to think what else there were, there were a couple of other questions that I had for you. Not many because I know I know you've got to go, and I and I got to go too because I got to, I got to get to bed for tomorrow morning. I know that's late for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right because you're a couple of hours. Um, you're yep. you're a couple of hours behind. Okay, now, here's a question specifically about because this was a a situation that a celebrity had a celebrity that we're all. Everybody in the chat knows who Young Jock is. You might or may or may not know who he is. Young mm -hmm. Jock had a situation where he sent money to the incorrect person at no fault of his own. Um, but Zell nor the incorrect person would ref uh, refund him the money. So Zell had the number registered 
to two different people uh -huh. and sent it to the incorrect contact. Oh, so wow. the question is, what liability does Zell hold when things like this happen? Well, see, that's the biggest thing. You use the, the word liability. And I think that's what Zell is in essence, because if I'm transferring $20 as a Bank of America associate for you to your mom or whatever, I hold liability. And if I screw this up, it's on me. Whenever someone, a third party, a third party service like Zelle is being used to send this money, even if it's through Bank of America, I don't know where Young Jock did it. If it was Bank of America, another bank, if he sent it through the bank's channels, it's him doing his own thing as a third party using a third party service. So the liability isn't on Zell, it's on Young Jock. It's basically saying, well, you know what, we registered to two people, but you know what, you should have asked for an email address or you should have asked for an alternate phone number. And I think that's the thing. It's the, it's the lack of clarity of who's going to help me when this happens. Is it going to be my bank or is it going to be Zell? Because if you, if you at Zell and say, hey, what happened to this? Zell's going to be like, contact your bank. And then if you contact your bank, they're going to say, well, it's a Zell issue. So, you know, the liability, like to me, I always said that Zell was just a way of kind of being the little brother that we have, the little sister that we have whenever we're four or five years old. And it's like, hey, who broke that plate? They did. You know what I mean? That's 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 the way the bank kind of pushes it off away from them into someone else. So I think that, you know, in a situation like that, you know, the liability is going to be placed on the user, on the person who's sending the money more than the bank or Zelle ever would, because I think that's the whole point of it. It's the whole point is to make everything self-service. That way we're not responsible for what you do with your money, basically. Damn. You know, and I respectfully disagree because I feel like you're my bank. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I feel like you're doing this for my bank account. You're my bank, which means you got my social security number. You got my phone number. Yeah, they know everything about you. Yeah. <laughs> you got my you got my everything. And if if you because in this case with young Jock, they had the same phone number registered to two different people. And that's right. where the problem was. The phone number with two different people. And it's like, I trust you with all my information. And you sit and you give you you allow the same email to be entered into your database and it goes to the wrong person. And it's suddenly my fault. And you got. I feel like that's crazy for you to blame that on me when I trust, you know, right. I, no, I hear if you that's right. the case, I could just use cash because a lot of people feel like cash app is risky and cash app can be risky in its own ways. But There's at this point, it seems like cash app is a little safer than so. I, you know, I would say so. I would say that the, it has its issues just like Zell does. I mean, you know, there's going to be fraud everywhere. You know, I always I always used to use the analogy was, you know, with VCRs. VCRs 50 years ago weren't popular until the porn industry started making, you know, pornography VHS. Ditto with DVDs or whatever. It got popular as things evolved or whatever. With Cash App and Zell, there's that trial and error stuff. Cash App's been around for a long time. There are still some people who take advantage of other people with Cash App. There's still people who take advantage of people using Zelle. So basically, there's this trial and error and this evolution of bad things that can happen. There's going to be criminals in every aspect of banking because every new technology that's going to come down the pike, people are going to be like, how are we going to mess with other people? Yeah. And Cash App is kind of like that because Cash App is owned by Twitter. You know, Cash App has that Twitter element to it. And of course, with all the things that we've seen with Twitter in the last several years, we know that there's people who have burner accounts who who know all the little intricacies of screwing with people on a service like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you have that tied to a social media platform and then you have Zelle tied to major banks, there are people who know how to take advantage of that. So, you know, like getting back to the young job thing or whatever, that very well could have been two people with the same phone number at two different banks. Or an you know, old phone number versus a new one, you know, when you get a yeah, new like phone number. If, if one was being uh, the same phone number at Bank of America and Wells Fargo, those two aren't communicating. Zell's the third party. So really the blame should be on Zell in that case for not identifying that. But those two banks don't talk to each other, nor do they want to talk to each other. So issues like that, just fluky things happen. And I do call it a fluke because, yeah, that's like a one in a thousand thing. But guess what? When you're that one of a thousand, it's your world. 
It doesn't even matter if you're a millionaire and you're sending a hundred bucks. Let me tell you something. You do not deserve my social security number if you can't protect me. Absolutely. Why should I give you my one, two, three, one, two, four? What's four plus two plus three? I don't have time to figure that out because I'm talking. <laughs> I'm trying to keep my train of thought. You do not deserve my social security number if you can't protect me from it, 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 from from basic purchases. Right, Why should right. I give you my social if you want to say, well, everything's here. If that's the case, I should have sent them cash in the mail for all like, like Yeah, you ask all these personal questions and you can't help me with a basic math problem. You can't help me with a basic customer service problem. And I, I'm starting to question, what are you doing with that information? And then those little note tools that, that we used to take as personal bankers, what are you writing down on me? You almost feel like, you know, the the psych- psychiatry patient that's like, what are you writing when I'm telling you my deepest, darkest secrets? I'm giving you all the tea, all the social security number, my personal information, how much I make in my job. And you're writing that down. Why? <laughs> like, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah, it is. What's this comment say? This comment says, I don't know why people think that they can only use cash out with a bank account linked and you must do a side account with a small amount of money in it. You know, the thing with Cash App is you don't have to disclose your first and last name. Right. Which is a big part of your identity, depending on what you do. Like, I mean, I'm a, I am I do stuff on YouTube and people like to send me money. It doesn't mean that everybody I send that, that sends me money, it doesn't mean that I want them to know my first and last name. That's why Cash App is imperative to me. I've never used Zelle to accept money. I don't use Venmo to accept money because... I don't have, to, I don't want my first and last name, you know, attached to it. Right. But to know that Zell has those types of glitches when Young Jock went, you know, Young Jock was trying to use social media. He was trying to use the court of public opinion. He was trying to to, to, to fester up the outrage within right. the court of public opinion and, and how the money got sent to the wrong person to get him some justice. And it's just, I, you know, I do feel like that's a little outrageous for them to have your social and to still feel like, but it's your fault. My fault. Yeah, yeah. right. And, and and that's the thing too. Like they, it's almost like they're trying to not, or they're, they're they're pretending to help you. They're pretending to work really hard to get to the bottom of this, but they really know that they're not really wanting to help you with it. You know, they 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 want to sell you these products. They want you to do these things, but at the end of the day, they don't want to do the hard work of of you know customer service should something hit the fan. You know, in, in a perfect world, you learn how to do it and you I never see you again if you have nothing for me sales wise or whatever. And I think with him having to use his popularity in order to get something done, guess what? I mean, that's that's what he had to do because he knew he had some clout. He knew that he could have enough rage and people tweeting at whatever bank saying, hey, this is what happened. And he knew he would finally get an answer. That was his only way of exerting influence at that point. That's true. That is true. Well, I don't want to keep you long. Here's what I'll do. Anybody, if you have any final questions, any final questions, please leave them below. I do have a commercial I'm going to play. It's a 60-second commercial. If there's anything extra that you want to say, if you want to think about it in the last 60 seconds, please do so. We'll play this commercial. You think about your final thoughts. We'll see if there's any final things. And we'll go ahead and wrap this up. I know you got to go. Lord knows I got to go. I got to get ready for tomorrow and um but before i play the commercial i'm grateful for you coming on first and foremost i i appreciate it this was a lot of fun like like you know we talked about this is a whirlwind day this is something where a little news story happens and you're like oh man so we got to talk about this we this is a moment that we need to share and you know i i have a pretty good social media following and notorious banker on twitter at bank better guy on twitter um I, you know, there's, there's so many people who listen to me and there's so many new people that I want to kind of be open to and be available to. If they, if you have any questions and I don't give financial advice, like what's the best savings account. If you have a general question about what you're feeling about banking, I'm here to answer it. And I really, I really appreciate you doing this because honestly, people don't talk about their money. People don't talk about their banking in rational ways and have decent conversations about it. It's something that is what I love to do, you know, you know, you called me an expert and I appreciate that, but it's my passion. You know, they, they taught me to care. Bank of America taught me to care. Then they told me not to care, but guess what? I still cared. And it doesn't matter. I've never met any of your, your followers of your fans, 
but I care about them and I care about their money too. And I want them to have a good experience, even if they choose a place like Bank of America or Zelle. I mean, you know, the true place to care is you can you can pitch your products or or where you come from or your advice. But if somebody goes somewhere else, if you really care about the betterment and the comfortability of them, you wouldn't mind if they went. So I mean, it might hurt your feelings, it might hurt your pockets, it might hurt what like whatever. But you ultimately care about them feeling safe, them being safe and being in a financial situation that suits them best exactly it's like do, do you want that do you want a person treating your grandma like that do you want that person treating your mom like that and do you want to be that person who's influencing someone's mom or grandma like that i didn't want to be that person and you know at the end of the day i would lay down and be like did i do right by by life was i a good human being that day or was i just looking out for myself and my job you immediately want to get out of that mindset i'm i'm in this position i do this content creation about banking um, because I care about people. And guess what? I'm not beholden to any company or any bank. And it's all coming from the heart and it's all coming from my knowledge. 13 years of the banking industry, five years of content creation. It's my life. It's my passion. And that's where it needs to come from. It needs to come from something you believe in. Mm -hmm. It is. Let's talk to you behind the scenes because I would like to offer you a segment on my show at least once a week about finances, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk behind the scenes about that. I think it'll help. I know you got your, your book thing going on and I want to promote that too, but let's get into this commercial. We'll be right back. We'll talk about all that stuff. Y'all make sure y'all hit thumbs up. If there are any final questions you have about money, Bank of America, Zelle, was your money effed up or affected today in some type of way, a friend that you know, Leave your questions. We're going to be right back in 60 seconds. Get into this Black-owned business, Stickies. It's got things for inside your home, outside your home, and even on the go. JasmineMadeIt.com is your new destination for black girl magic mugs, tumblers, and even wine glasses. You can even customize the tumblers and wine glasses. There's a lot going on for a low price over at jasminemadeit.com. And if you've been serious about wanting to support more Black-owned businesses, here's your chance. Let jasminemadeit.com handle all your problems for family and friends. You ever had a friend over and they just wasn't catching a hint or paying the rent? Y'all asses all get to stepping! <laughs> yeah, tell them to get to stepping with this nostalgic Martin-themed doormat and shop over a dozen different doormat designs over on jasminemadeit.com. Alright, stickies, you know what time it is. It's time to put your money where your mouth is and shop black today. Make life easier for you and your household by taking your family's hot or cold beverages on the go with one of these unique tumblers. It's insulated to keep your beverage at temperature and it comes with a few different reusable straws and even the specific brush that you need to wash it so you can keep it sanitized and germ free. They've got all kinds of designs to match your mood or style. So grab something for your wife, the hubby, or even the kids over on jasminemadeit.com. That's jasminemadeit.com, and I'll see you over there. Ooh. We got a technical issue over there with him. Nonetheless, listen, we have had an amazing, an amazing expert here. He's an eight times author. He is a retail banking expert. He is a consumer, I'm sorry, a customer service strategist and a consumer advocate for people impacted by big banks and a former Bank of America manager. I truly enjoyed having him on here. He, um, I want to share some stuff about myself that honestly I didn't want to share before. I ain't even going to hold you. Um, I'm nervous to do so. I'm not even going to hold. And y'all know I'm never nervous. This is my own channel. I'm never nervous on my own channel. But I am a little bit nervous to share. What I'm thinking about. Um, about my personal experience and what I know. Um, I used to work at Bank of America. That's the bottom line. I used to work at Bank of America. And um, I was a personal banker at Bank of America. So I wasn't a teller. I was a personal banker. So it was my job to sell financial solutions to, you know, to, to, to customers and to upsell them into things that they weren't necessarily um, interested in. 
And um, I can honestly say, like, Bank of America really, they, 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 they don't have a lot of ethics. So I left a lot of, I left a lot of, of, of him sharing his experience up to him. I'm, I, you know, I'm asking him, what do you think about how Bank of America feel about ethics? But I know how I feel about Bank of America's ethics because it's trash. They, they, they try to get you to push. Um, they try to get you to push finances or, or, or financial solutions on people who aren't even, who aren't feeling it, who aren't fit, who aren't equipped and so on and so forth. Um, and so that's something that I was really afraid to share with y'all in the beginning of this video. I don't know why. I don't know why. I just didn't want to tell y'all I used to work for them for like nine months. Um, and I quit. <laughs> I quit and um, it was one of those slower banking it was one of those slower places that was up the street from a place from it, it was like less than about like three quarters of a mile from one of the facilities that was banging and booming and had high numbers so in nine months we had three different banking managers and they were always just doing crazy stuff. And I would say shady stuff in order to try to meet quota or encourage their personal bankers to meet quota. And a lot of the stuff that they were trying to encourage us to do, it it, it was not ethical. It was not ethical. And I was like 22 years old. And I might not have been able to put it into words, but I just knew like it was not right. It, it didn't feel right. It wasn't okay. They wanted me to talk every 18-year-old into a credit card. And, like, that's not ethical. That's not ethical. So I can't really speak on Zelle. Zelle wasn't a thing when I was working for Bank of America. But um, Bank of America can be pretty trash. Am I still with them in some capacity? Because I do have money in a couple different places. Even though I had one debit card with me today. Um, and I thought I was affected by it, but I wasn't. But I still felt empowered to talk about this. Like, yeah. But um, Bank of America can still be trash in a lot of ways. And I know that firsthand. I still got some of my old... I literally still have some of my old business cards. But, like, nonetheless, I do appreciate the guests that we had. I think that they had... Yeah, technical difficulties. Um... But, you know, I did have my own personal experience with Bank of America. And um, they can be pretty trash. And um, sorry, it's kind of I was I was kind of nervous to let y'all know about that. Um, they want you to always put in auto loans for people literally one out of every 39 people get approved for the auto loans. One out of every 15 people might get approved for the credit cards. The, like these people, they, they just want the applications and you'll get the money based off the applications. You don't get necessarily get the money based off of the approvals. So, you know, Bank of America can be pretty, pretty trash. Okay. Because I just wanted to let y'all know about that. Um... And so me, you know, I can be very opinionated and I am very opinionated, okay? I'm extremely opinionated. But I think, I, I think the spirit of Jesus Christ was with me when I worked with Bank of America because when I worked for Bank of America because I was very meek at the time when they were trying to pressure me to do things that I thought I found to be unethical. I did. I found those things to be unethical that they were asking me of. And I'm glad that I was meek at that time because that stuff, not only was it breaking the code, some of the stuff was breaking the law. Some of the stuff can ruin your resume. After I quit, um, there were about like five to eight employees who got fired after I left because they were doing unethical stuff in order to meet goal. Because their goal is pretty rigorous, whether you're in a high volume place or a low volume place. Uh, but nonetheless, let me go ahead and close this up. I did just want to share that with y'all. Like, I do have personal experience with Bank of America. 
Um, and they can be kind they can be pretty trash at times. And so it was nice speaking to another employee here. And I was telling him, you know, I was telling him this beforehand when we were talking. Um, and I was telling him, like, I don't want to share this. I'm not going to share this. But and we were talking about the different things like the Bank of America, like somebody could come in and like you at, at the time when I was working there, you couldn't change your. You couldn't change your your PIN number to your debit card through the teller. You would have to do it through a personal banker. So they, they would expect for you to turn somebody that just wants to change their debit card number into a mortgage refinance or an auto loan or a credit card. And that's not only is that not always possible, even if you're doing a financial review, which is what they called it, it it's it's it it's pesky to the customer. But it also just doesn't fit their financial landscape and their plans and their goals. It doesn't fit. Like you're pressuring customers who literally only want a certain type of thing. And like that wasn't okay. And that never sat well to me. And so um, I would have customers and my, and my, you know, my manager at the time would be like, this person changed their debit card. How come you didn't turn this into a credit card app? Or how come you... And I'm like, because it's not what they wanted. Did you ask? Yeah, I asked. I asked a couple of different times in a couple of different ways, but that's not what they wanted. Bank of America don't care. They just, they just want the results. And that's what leads to people creating results out of ways that really are not ethical. So I didn't like it. It wasn't for me. Um, the only reason that I am still with... Um, Bank of America is because when I travel across the states, I know that there's always going to be an ATM or a location if I have like an issue or a situation. Like, that's it. That that that's the only reason. But I do still bank with, um, I do still bank with other places. But Bank of America can be really trash. They're they're predatory. They want you to pitch every 18-year-old with a credit card. I feel like that's trash as well. I feel like that's trash. You should not be pitching 18-year-olds with credit cards. You really should not. You really should not. Um, Licorice said upselling is toxic. In a financial institution, yes, it is. But see, when I worked, when I was a when I went to Bank of America as a personal banker, I <clears throat> I went from food sales to financial sales. So upselling in the food industry, it really feels harmless because it is. If, I, if I'm able to talk you into another drink or another six shrimp with your surf and turf or a dessert, you wanted it. And really, that's not anything I'm about to feel guilty about when I go home. That's th Those are easy upsells, being a bartender or a server. But going from there to a financial institution and you talking about mortgages and car loans and pulling people credit and stuff like that based off of them only wanting to change the debit card number it's not the same that's that's trash that's wrong it's effed up it, it is and my conscience was it look again if i was to go back to working at a restaurant right now and i'm able to talk you into another drink another six shrimp or dessert you you low-key wanted that even if you take it home or whatever the case is, like you wanted that. There's nothing toxic or wrong about that. But in a financial aspect, it's different. It's different. And my conscience was very much working. My moral compass was very much intact. And that's why I was only there for nine months. And your looks can only work for you for so long in a financial institution. Now, in, a food, in the food service industry, when I look the way that I looked, Especially because I was a little bit skinnier. Even though I feel like if I went back now, I'd still be able to do a little something. But your looks are only going to work for you for a certain amount of time in the, in the in the financial industry. Even though they shouldn't, but because it's really only going to work on your regular customers. The customers who come there all the time and they're just like, ooh, new employee. Let me sit at your desk and just look at your eye. Yeah, what? What you trying to sign me up for? I'm going to sign up for it like that. Like creepy ass niggas like that. 
It might work a couple of, but it's not going to work for everybody. And honestly, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. So I had to get out of there because we're talking about people credit. Like y'all are crazy. I go from affecting people in the food service industry and up talking them from a drink and six shrimp to pulling a credit and them didn't get declined or whatever. No, 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 no. I don't like that. My conscience can't handle that. I'm ruthless. I'm from Baltimore. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ruthless in a couple of cents. I'm ruthless in a couple of senses. Yes, I am. But when it comes to people's finances and the things and their, their mortgages and car loans and things like that, and, and honestly, shit that I know they're not going to get approved for, Bank of America don't approve nobody. First of all, Bank of America approves one of every 50 people in their car loans. Bank of America approves one of every 25, 30 people went with the credit cards. So you get the money based off of the applications, but you know nine times out of 10 them people not going to get approved. So you get money just based off talking people into pulling a credit and, and credit polls do a little something to your credit. I, mm -mm. Mm -mm. it don't really do what I needed to do. What I wanted to do, it doesn't do any of that. Um, and it makes me feel guilty when I leave work at night. And that's why I don't mind that being a part of my life where I felt really meek. And I didn't do a lot of what was asked. There is more that I want to share about it. But nonetheless, baby. Let me make sure. Okay. okay. Thank you. No, he's still here. The notorious, the notorious banker. Are you still here? Yeah, he don't know. He's still here. He's somewhere in the background doing whatever he needed. It's okay. It's time for us to go. Okay. It's not right at all, and I didn't want to live with that because I dealt with somebody trying to mess up my credit because I was young. I was ignorant. I didn't understand. Um, it's not okay. It's not okay. Um, so, I used to work there too at a terminal, but I didn't know how to treat their employees. I'll have some stuff. Just close my account. All the bad service I'll be done. They keep my money. I don't blame you. It's important to keep your money in a couple of different places. Nonetheless, I do appreciate having this brother on. He does have a, a book. You can check out the notoriousbanker.com. His name on Twitter is at Bank Better Guy. Matter of fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it on the screen. Okay. As I stated earlier, though, the information provided does not constitute as investment, financial, trading, or, or any other sort of advice. And you should not treat any of the content as such. Okay. I want you all to understand that. But this is the website um, or the app of his on Twitter that you can check out. He is there and he is tweeting heavily about this because it's something that he's passionate about. He's really, really passionate about this stuff. Okay. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Lofi. I, I, can, I, can, I, I can hear you. I didn't think you could hear me no more. I thought you was done. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I, I I can't hear anything coming here, but I can I can see you obviously. Oh, I didn't know you could hear because the screen the screen is completely hmm. black. Everything is all the way up here. I can't hear you. <laughs> oh my bad. I didn't know you could hear me anymore. Don't know what's going on. Sorry, something messed up. Um, even though the screen is black, if you want to put in a final plug about your book where people can find you, I do have your Twitter at, at bank better guy on the screen, but if you want to give like a final plug for where people can find you, your work, what you're about, if you want to go ahead and give that, the floor is open to you. If you wanted to um, give that info.
Did you um did you want to give that info or you just wanna um if you're tired and you oh Oh, it looks like you're still here. Okay. Are you still here? I can see you. Did you want to say something? Like Tess? I can hear you whispering, so I know your sound work. Um, it's okay. I don't think he knows anything about StreamYard. His child, he came back on the camera. He came back on the camera. And okay, he's back again. Okay. Hey. Yeah, because I, I really wanted him to plug his stuff in. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can, hear, I can hear you before too, believe it or not. But. Yeah, like, I don't know what was going on here. And my phone was like at 7% too. I'm like, oh crap, is my phone shutting down on me or something? I got you. I get it. What I do, I put your, I put your Twitter on the screen. And if you wanted to give people like, um, the, uh, like a final say so of where they can find you, what your book is about, um, and, and what you're about in general, just to plug yourself in. Cause I know you got some stuff you want to plug in and you deserve to plug that in because I'm grateful that you were even here. Well, I appreciate it. While of course, bank better guy on Twitter, that is, um, how I got started doing this thing about five years ago. Um, I've actually developed quite a little successful TikTok account. It's at Notorious Banker, all one word. And um, I, I would really appreciate your followers following me on YouTube. Um, it's oh. at, yeah, um, I'm trying. That, that's honestly the only one that I haven't been able to get going with the exception of the Kugler videos because I uploaded those. And that's um, at the Notorious Banker on YouTube, all one word um that's on there as well um you have a youtube channel yes i do <laughs> let me look that up you can keep talking i'm sorry I'm oh yeah no and then um actually today because of the zell news i started a sub stack i wanted to blog again i wanted to be able to write daily so uh, when this happened this morning i just decided what the hell I'm going to write about what I know. And in 20 minutes, I whipped up this nice little thousand word blog about what was going on and, you know, sharing screenshots and whatever. And you can find that at um, the notorious Um, I'm going to be talking bank stuff on there. And then I'm also going to be talking customer service experiences, you know, little things that we go through going to CVS, Walgreens. Um, I have a restaurant story I want to share actually donate blood twice a week and i'm actually going through some issues at the blood bank because i lift weights and my biceps are 19 inches and they can't fit the the, the cuff around me to do my blood pressure oh yeah so they're and they're refusing to um budge with that they're like well we can't help you i'm like you're you're telling me i can't donate because I made a decision to better my life and be healthy, you know? So I wanted to talk about little customer service quirks like that. I really think people can be more effective at um, dealing with customer service issues if they're properly trained and properly educated um, by someone like yours truly, who was a manager, who's heard it all and seen it all working mm -hmm. in the bank. You, you've heard, you know, you've heard one story, you've heard it a million times. And I, I really think sharing that knowledge and sharing it in a humorous perspective, you know, I this was a serious topic that we talked about today. Um, but I do want to emphasize, you know what, there's some humor in this crazy world that we live in. And sometimes the best way to educate people is through laughter. So I try to do that, especially with TikTok, but I'm going to try to do that with my writing too. Um, I'm also on Instagram at Notorious Banker, all one word. Uh, typically, I just post the content that's from my other social media channels there. But, you know, everyone has their favorite social media, you know, platform. So I try to be everywhere really on there. Facebook isn't really my thing anymore. So I try to kind of stay away from that. Facebook um, for the old people. Yeah, that's true. I'm not old yet. I'm not old yet. <laughs> so yeah, I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, get out there and be what I can when I can and spend hours upon hours a day talking about the stuff that i love but i'm i'm most prominent on twitter and tiktok at bank better guy on twitter at notorious banker on tiktok um 
those allow me to be creative and be um, almost real time with any news that's happening. And there's always an angle there's, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm a, an American, just like everyone else. We all have our opinions on things and we all want to share them with everyone. Well, I have a unique perspective from the job that I have, the life that I lived and the life that I continue to lead. And I really think that you will enjoy my content if you check it out, because um, as boisterous and as crazy as I can be, I'm a humble person at the end of the day. And this stuff means a lot to me. And if I can influence someone to better their lives financially or, you know, customer service wise, then I've done my job. I understand. I appreciate it. You know what? I do look forward to collaborating with you um, in another way in the future because, you know, financial literacy is, it's really important. Yeah. Whether it's every week or, you know, once every two weeks or whenever you find something that's, you know, trending and hot or or, or something that you find. And, and I know you're all, you, I can tell by your page, I was reading the pages. <laughs> <laughs> you're always going to find something relevant when it comes to um, finances and things of that nature. So I look forward to continuously communicating with you on the back end to figure out what yep. we can do to get information out to my people and having you on and, um, you know, plugging in, whether it be your book, your, uh, in, you know, your Amazon books, your YouTube channel, your Twitter or things of that nature. Um, I do look forward to that because I'm I'm knowledgeable in quite a few different um, aspects or categories, but you know, sometimes you've got to admit when you aren't, I'm not a financial expert. I'm not, you are though. <laughs> and I don't mind. And I would enjoy presenting financial expert advice to my people, but not necessarily me doing it, you doing it. You know what I mean? Right. So having a financial expert on, like I'm having you on right now, um, I feel like it does my platform a service. It lets people know that I, I care about um, their financial literacy. And um, I think it does a good thing for you, me, and the people watching as well. Right. And I appreciate that. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you said that. That means a lot to me because, you know, it's one of those things. It's a shared experience. You know, not everyone's going to be rich. Not everyone's going to, you know, live the life that you and I lead. But we all are bank customers. You know, we all, you know, we eat three square meals a day and all that stuff. It's a shared experience. And I think that there's some people who just don't have the knowledge with that experience. And that was the one thing that I enjoyed was, you know, teaching people about my role when I was in banking. And I think teaching people about banking from afar is still something that means a lot to me. So if I can help, you know, you know, anyone that follows you in any way, that'd be good. So we can definitely talk about it. I, I'd be more than open to talking about these things in the future um, on a on a regular basis, if you like, because I really think that there are people who have questions, but there's also a lot of people who are afraid to ask those questions. And it takes them a while to get comfortable. It takes a while for them to go all out and finally, you know, say that thing that they want to know. And I'm I'm more than happy to be here for that. Awesome. I appreciate it. I hope that you have an amazing evening. I look forward to connecting with you tomorrow just to, you know, kind of uh, talk about and conspire some different ways in which um, we can go about having you on again, with, you know, whether it be for a shorter segment or whatever the case is. But I hope you have an amazing evening and thank you for sharing your 13 years of experience and your expertise based off of that at Bank of America. It means a lot. I appreciate it. You have a good night too. And thanks everyone for listening. Awesome. We'll do. Have a good one. All righty. It's time for bed for me, y'all. Let me tell y'all something. I'm sleepy. We did two shows this evening. I never do two shows. Well, I haven't done two shows on the main channel in a long time. And so with that being said, I'm kind of tired. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of sleepy. Somebody gonna say in the Discord, Jane, you look really tired. I mean, like, yeah, but I might be, but I was working hard tonight. Um, so this was a really good show. I'm gonna get off of here. Y'all know I always tell y'all exactly when I'm watching on TV, right? I'm watching when I get off of here and when I click this in button, I'm going over to my room and I am watching the Twilight Zone. I'm gonna finish watching the second season by Jordan Peele on. I think it's available on Paramount Plus. 
so good because Jordan Peele always have you thinking, even though it's been having me talking in my sleep lately. But that's not important, right? It's not important. I'm finna get off of here and watch the Twilight Zone as I end this video. But no, this 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 was a really good live. I do enjoy talking about financial literacy. It's something I know a little bit about because you know I mean me working at Bank of America for a little less than a year. Um, it 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 did a little something, but I'm I'm not an expert. This that this guy, the what the, the notorious banker, he's an expert. So I wouldn't mind having him on the show every um I don't know, every week, every whatever we can agree to. Whenever we can find topics that are, um, you know, relevant and make sense, I would not mind having him on um, as often as, you know, we can discuss stuff that makes sense. Um, but I don't mind bringing y'all financial literacy that makes sense. I would love to have a person that really can talk about politics that makes sense. I'm really trying to look for people that have different areas of expertise to create different like types of shows for you all. Um, he makes a lot of sense as, as far as what it is that he speaks about. Um, but this was great. Okay, this was great. Somebody said my eyes are red. My eyes are red, and it's crazy because I don't understand why, baby. I ain't had none of the devil's lettuce. I ain't had nothing, nothing. I guess I'm just tired. Um, but yeah, this was this was a really good show. Um, it's not gonna get as many views as the celebrity gossip because people like bullcrap more than they like to really be informed about stuff that makes more sense. So, but. It is what it is. It was still worth it to make this video, put it on the channel, put it on the main channel and make it uh, and 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 make it public. So, look, I love you all so much. I'm going to get off of here. It's 108. I got time to watch maybe one or two episodes of Jordan Peele tonight because they like 45 minutes apiece. <clears throat> and I still got to get up tomorrow for work at what I got to get up. I got to get up at 730. So it'll still be worth it. I love you all so much. Okay, somebody said check my DMs. Okay, I'm here for it. Okay, so uh, y'all are here for the financial literacy segment. Y'all are here to bring him on like like once a week or once every two weeks or something like that. Cause if y'all are, let me know. Cause I could I can I can discuss that with him. If y'all really want to hear what he gotta say, if y'all really feel like um it's worth it. I think it is, but let me know if y'all think it is. Okay, I see a yes. That's what we need. I see, okay. I see some. It's a, oh, yeah, okay. Several yes. There's a lot of people who want, okay. So that's what we'll talk about. Need to show, very informative. Yeah, because he, his, I mean, his, his financial literacy goes beyond just the everyday dollar in a, in, like, in a savings account. Like, he's really talking about, how to maneuver around the um, these financial institutions, which is important. So it seems like a, a lot of y'all grown up combo. Okay. So this is what well, I'll definitely make sure while I'm at work tomorrow. I um, Yeah, I do feel that I'm getting tired. Y'all see that my eyes are red. Mind y'all business. <laughs> no, but um, this is something I will talk to him tomorrow about. Okay. Jane was asking great questions. Yeah, because I, I do have a little bit of knowledge about the financial institution. All right, you guys, I've got to get off of here. I love you all so much. Y'all stay beautiful. Y'all stay black. Y'all stay blessed. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button if you haven't already. Okay. Um, And I will continue to read your comments that you have placed in the live chat tomorrow as well and keep them in mind as if he's open to formulating the segment on the show then that will be absolutely amazing and i will keep your questions and your suggestions in mind for um said things okay thank you all so much i love when y'all come out the bush at the end some of y'all ain't commenting y'all the whole video but y'all come out at the end thank you Jen. thank you thank you I appreciate y'all. Y'all have an amazing night. I love you all so much. Stay beautiful, black, and blessed. Hit thumbs up, subscribe, think critically and independently. Keep in mind, this none of this was financial advice, all right? This, these are just opinions from people who think things about the financial industry, okay?
deuces. I'll see y'all later on today or tomorrow. Bye. But that's it. If you want to catch more of my commentary on black culture or vital and trending information, be sure to subscribe by hitting that little circle in the middle of the screen, or I'll catch you in one of these rectangles to the right in another video. I'll see you there.